Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mitch Medigovich, for those of you who don't know me. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here for our 2020 uh, session for our, our Strategic uh, Planning Committee. And at this time, I'd like to, uh, Paul, if you can go ahead and uh, uh, do a roll call for us, please. Hello, yes. Here. California Highway Patrol. Here. Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Here. Department of Technology. Here. Emergency Medical Services Authority. Here. Department of Finance. Andrew Duffy, Department of Finance here. Department of Fish and Game. Here. Department, the Department of Forestry and Fire, Fire Protection. Here. Department of Justice. Here. Military Department. Understand? Department of Public Health. <clears throat> Department of Parks and Recreation. Here. Department of Transportation. Here. Department of Water Resources. Here. We have a core. I feel like we've uh, excluded part of our membership in the back, so is there any way we can put them at the, at the round table, or is that... Uh, definitely can. So, thank you. So as we, um, move into, uh, 2020, I think it's important that we, I, I just want to do a couple things. One is I want to welcome everybody. And two, I also want to maximize your time and, uh, the, and leverage this, uh, meeting opportunity to really get into the heart of, uh, what we will all care about, which is good, uh, interoperable communications um, that'll work together and hopefully eliminate some of the issues that we have. So we have some presentations that will continue that we started last time. Um, but a lot of the, the dialogue that we bring together uh, will help set the conditions for this, uh, this upcoming year. And I really want to maximize that and, and open it up in a way that we can really be beneficial for everybody when it comes to what we're doing. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, ask that we review the... Uh, March and July uh, meeting minutes so that we can officially approve those if you haven't already read them. Uh, should be in your packet. And if everybody is okay with those meeting minutes, then we'll, I just need to get a, a motion to approve the minutes um, as presented. Mitch, uh, yes. just would note that um, Director of Finance's name is spelled incorrectly on this. Thank you, Andrew. We'll make that adjustment. Any other comments? Okay. Do I have a motion? Uh, Cal Fire will make the motion to approve the minutes as drafted and amended, uh, dated March 28, 2019, and July 25th, uh, 2019. Second. 
And All right. Second. Thank you. Excellent. And then, uh, is there, I guess I'll ask if there's any dissent. I don't think there's going to be so that uh, we'll say that that motion carries and we're uh, good to approve the minutes uh, here uh, based on the comments. So thank you, everybody. So our next item is to uh, uh, looking to uh, for a vote to approve our Public Safety Radio Strategic Planning Committee Working Group Charter. Um, so if you can please take a look at that if you haven't had a chance to yet, um, and ensure that we are capturing uh, the vision of what we're looking at here for our, our working group. Okay, if everybody's had a chance to scan the charter, uh, it asks us there if you uh, feel comfortable with that or any amendments that we need to present uh, that you think it's either ambiguous or needs to be added uh, to the charter at this time. Uh, Mitch, is a point of clarification, under membership, uh, the draft charter says see attached membership listing. Obviously, that is not uh, available here for us today as this is a draft. Is it the intent uh, of this group? to have uh, a representative on the technical working group that is uh, a designee of each one of the member agencies on the committee? Um, ideally, that would be the case, if, but if there's a, a particular group that doesn't have that uh, availability to it, we'll work with whatever is available you know, from uh, the membership that is presenting to it, because we'll just use that brain trust as our primary uh, working group to, uh, to come forward with uh, proposals and, and considerations. Thank you. No questions. Any other comments? All right, making it easy. So um, appreciate that. So if it's time, then if we have a, uh, a vote or an, uh, a, uh, a motion, thank you, to uh, approve the, uh, the charter as listed. CHB makes a motion to approve charter as listed. And a second. And a second from Cal Fire. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. And no opposed? Okay, hearing no voices, we'll move on. Uh, that motion is approved. And we'll move on to our next item. Um, this time I'd like to introduce uh, Reggie Salvador uh, from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. He's going to provide a update uh, for us. Why don't you come up here next to me, Reggie? Uh, good afternoon, folks. Just uh, wanted to uh, uh, just uh, talk about a couple of bills on both the state and uh, federal side uh, that are currently in play during this uh, last half of the two-year session. Uh, AB 1366 by Assemblymember Gonzalez is the uh, Voice Over Internet Protocol uh, Communication Services Bill, which would extend the sunset date of Section 710 of uh, the Public Utilities Code, which deregulated VoIP 
but um, that sunset date through this bill would extend to January 1st of 2025. That bill is currently still uh, held in the Senate Committee on Energy Utilities and Communications, uh, which means that Section 710 essentially uh, meant that VoIP would be deregulated until December 31st of 2019. So as of currently of 2020, VoIP is now re-regulated by the CPUC. Uh, SB 431, which is by Senator McGuire, would require the CPUC in consultation with Cal OES to develop and implement performance reliability standards for cell towers within Tier 2 and Tier 3 high fire threat areas that include, number one, establishing a minimum operating life for backup power systems of no less than 48 hours, and number two, establishing means to warn customers when backup power systems is low, are low and could no longer be supported. Uh, it's currently in the Assembly Communications and Conveyance Committee, chaired by Assemblyman uh, Miguel Santiago. And bless you, whoever sneezed. Um, additionally, SB 734 by Senator Stern uh, would permit county social service department's employees to share contact information of elderly or disabled persons to emergency services personnel during a public safety power shutoff. Uh, that, I believe, this week passed Senate appropriations and is currently on the Senate floor. Uh, uh, lastly, SB 794 by Assemblymember Jackson would allow local government to enter into agreements with local social services departments to access contact information for people with access and functional needs in order to enroll them in local alert and warning system programs. That is been triple referred to the Senate Committee on Governmental Organization, the Senate Energy Utilities and Communications Committee, as well as the Senate Judiciary Committee. So on the federal side, H.R. 292 by uh, Congress, Congress Member Curtis streamlines broadband permit processes by allowing states and tribes certain authorities for permitting within land owned by the National Forest System, Department of Interior, as well as tribes. It is currently in the House Subcommittee on Conservation and Forestry. Uh, S-273 by Senator Roberts is the Kelsey Smith Act, which would require communication service providers to share users' device locations with law enforcement officers or public safety answering point representatives to respond to a call for assistance or life-threatening emergencies. And that is currently located in the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Technology. Uh, also, H.R. 3836 by Congresswoman Eshoo out of California would amend the Federal Communications Act to allow states to develop terms and conditions for infrastructure resiliency of wireless service providers by authorizing states to require wireless companies to deploy infrastructure that can withstand disasters. That bill has been co-sponsored by 15 members of the California Congressional Delegation as well, and that is currently in the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Lastly, of note, is that as a result of the PSPS events from October, because Congresswoman Eshoo had introduced this bill as well, that her as well as Congressman Thompson and the entire California congressional delegation has requested from has requested of the House uh, Committee on Energy and Commerce as well as the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology to hold a formal hearing on the role of telecommunications and public safety based upon the October wildfire and PSPS events that Formal request is still outstanding, and uh, we are to be hearing more of that come later on the session. And that should be it for now. That is seven fifth about, about towers. Seven fifty three. No, but but the one about towers is SB four thirty one. Any questions? From your perspective, Reggie, um, looking at this, uh, our working group, 
And since all of these touch us in different ways, what's throughout there, is there anything that you wanted to highlight of particular interest uh, to us that you think is going to be uh, of significant ramifications uh, for uh, state agencies? I think based upon the um, technical expertise surrounding this strategic planning committee, I would think that the input that the agencies have to provide would be beneficial based upon their own respective jurisdictional and programmatic responsibilities. And as such, anything that could enhance those programmatic responsibilities uh, for the uh, public safety uh, aspects would be a great thing. And if they, those, those, uh, those items can be communicated up to, uh, to our Office of Legislative and External Affairs, that would be great through, through, uh, through you and this uh, committee. Okay, thank you. Um, and lastly, I was going to ask you a question regarding the uh, federal legislation for broadband uh, permitting on federal uh, areas. Is do you see? Um, and uh, again, that's tribal and, and federal lands. Tribal and federal lands. Yeah. And so the purpose of that bill is to allow to give greater flexibility for the carriers then to establish and and build. Infrastructure in those areas? Is that, I believe right? so. It, it streamlined the permitting process because of the fact that, as everyone uh, is fully aware, when it comes to permitting, whether it's on local, state, or federal lands, there's an environmental process that can be uh, very um, uh, cumbersome. And so industry would tend, would, would, would rather hope to, you, to streamline some of those processes. Reggie, quick question. Uh, with that, is there would there be any applicability to public agencies? Because I know that public agencies run into the same same challenge on federal lands to get. Uh, radio yeah, infrastructure. I would think that'd be the sim similar, similar. But obviously, you know, private, public, you know, sector you know, entities would all kind of operate under the same uh, under different under different um, you know part in the term utility functions, if you will. That's a great point, uh, Chief Allen, particularly some of the challenges we had uh, with site selection to do the Red Mountain project that we've been working on here up north and uh, the initial refusal uh, on that federal land. So that was, that's a great point. Uh, any other questions for uh, Reggie? All right. Hey, thanks, uh, Mr. Salvador. I appreciate the update. And uh, this time we'll go ahead and transition to uh, Mr. Hank O'Neill who is going to uh, provide an update to us um, uh, from the SWIC side of the household. Good afternoon. I'm Hank O'Neill. I'm the Emergency Communication Division Chief here at Cal OES, and I work in the 911 branch for Budge Courier. The update I'm going to give is on the statewide Interoperability Executive Committee. Uh, through the uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency Emergency Communication Division, they have a technical assistance program in which we're allowed five requests annually. Uh, these are derived from the offerings as the catalog changes from year to year. We base our request to further enhance California's interoperability and provide strategic support in advancing California's statewide communications interoperability plan, SCIP, the 2019 National Emergency Communications Plan, and state interoperability performance markers as measured on the interoperability continuum. The links to the CalSCIP, CalIFOG, National IFOG, and the National Emergency Communication Plan can all be found on Cal OES's website under the California Interoperable Communications. The first update is on the CalSCIP, which is included in this year's uh, technical assistance. We will be updating the SCIP this year, and the project begins in May. The Cal IFOG uh, was under a technical assistance last year. It's in the process of being uh, updated as well as integrated into a mobile app. All the updates have been received. Uh, we should be finalizing it within the next month, and then it'll take about two months for the app to actually uh, be developed and deployed. As I mentioned, we're allotted five requests annually. 
of the five that we submitted this year, we were uh, approved for all five, and we were additionally approved for a sixth course. Uh, if you'd like, I could go over which courses we have coming this year. So the first one is the skip update, as I mentioned. The next one is a communication unit exercise for communication unit trainees, uh, tentatively scheduled for May. We have an incident tactical dispatcher training course scheduled for April. We have a communication-focused full-scale exercise that is going to be held in San Diego in November. Cal OES is hosting the Radio Rodeo for San Diego this year, and in conjunction with that Radio Rodeo, we are going to hold a full-scale exercise. We are holding an incident communication center manager course in March. We have an all-auxiliary communications training course that is going to be held also in March. And those are the courses for this year. Last year's technical assistance, uh, we have an outstanding information technology service unit leader training course that is on hold, pending uh, scheduling with the local host agency. And then the other one that I did not mention yet is the communication operational assessment of Lake Tahoe and Truckee region. That is supposed to be delivered uh, the middle of next month, and that turns into a, a follow-up technical assistance for the state of Nevada, which will, they'll get into an engineering technical assistance. Those are the uh, most of the updates for the CalSeq. Additionally, there's two more updates, one on ESF2, Emergency Support Function 2. Cal OES is a lead agency for this Emergency Support Function communications. As the lead organization, we are going to be reaching out to all state agencies to request that you provide a uh, primary and alternate communication contact for this function, and we use primarily for uh, information sharing, both during and outside of emergency activations. One of those will be to update the CASM, the Communications Asset Survey and Mapping Tool. Basically, it's a geographically uh, oriented um, app that you can see which assets are available uh, statewide. And then uh, one Senate bill that we'd like to update on is 670, um, the Telecommunications Community Isolation Outage Notification. Um, we fully anticipate the information that will be reported through this Senate bill will be timely, precision, uh, impact area designation down to the zip code, and it'll be actionable at the local level. The public comment period will end at the conclusion of the public hearing, which is scheduled for Tuesday, February 4th. Then the last item I'd like to give an update on is the next-gen 911 contract, which is progressing. Uh, the primary contract, ATOS, who has primary responsibilities for Olympic communication systems, is the primary. And they've hired four subcontractors um, for four regions across the state. This will significantly enhance location accuracy and provide redundant pathways. It also, the contract also has an alert and warning component, where with the state will be providing an alert and warning platform uh, statewide. Currently, they're subcontracted with Everbridge. Um, there's been significant outreach efforts across the state to all the PSAPs, and additionally, follow-on outreach to all the mutual aid region committees to uh, socialize what's going to happen when this starts being implemented. And uh, Budge Couriers recorded one of those presentations that's available on YouTube. So if you haven't been able to attend one, it's very informative. It's about two hours. So that's all I have for my update. Any questions? Just to remind everyone that the courses are going to be posted online uh, with your site, correct? Yes. So uh, they're available for everyone there uh, on it. And then I think it's important to provide a little more clarification um, on the emergency support function too, and, and who's currently working with you, uh, the State Operations Center, when you're doing that work, and then kind of what, uh, what that role in that interface is that you're trying to achieve, hey? So primarily right now as a lead agency for communications, uh, Cal OES coordinates primarily with other lead agencies of, other, of either other ESFs. So our primary uh, reach out has been with uh, Caltrans for ESF1, and a couple others. So what we're trying to do is actually have these agencies designate somebody specifically for communications so that we can um, create synergy and also staffing that may be necessary if we have a larger scale disaster than what we're used to. 
And then part of that function, uh, just for the rest of the, the members, is that uh, we found ourselves in this last public safety power shutoff um, not uh, challenged other than refueling and the occasional problem with generators, either propane or diesel, within our uh, radio communications for ourselves, but found a significant challenge with all of our um, wireless and wireline uh, communication. So uh, because of the infrastructure not having the same hardening that we um, enjoy are for ourselves. However, as we all know, most of our uh, employees um, uh, and, of course, the public are all counting on the wireline wireless to work. And so that interface between all of us, whether it's an alert and warning function or it is a uh, backup for area that you might have uh, interference or just a you know, problem with comms uh, for yourselves, uh, became uh, grossly challenged for us there. So uh, significant uh, hard work there, uh, unique challenge for us in October. And if there's interest, we can uh, come back to that again at a later point and kind of walk everybody through uh, what those challenges were and what they've uh, entailed. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, 670 and the, uh, and the new reporting uh, guidelines as they come out will change some of that for us so we can provide more rapid information to um, all of us that are part of the whole of government response um, so that you can have uh, good information out there when we're doing our work. So, Thank you, Hank. Any other questions for uh, Mr. O'Neill? All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, asking uh, Mr. Pat Mallon to uh, come uh, forward. He's our assistant director here at Public Safety Communications uh, to provide his update. Good afternoon. You know, as we've um, had some previous discussions, um, you know, among some of the members of this board um, about the uh, the need for interoperable communications across the state, particularly during times of emergencies. You know, we can look at the at the recent fires and, and some of the PSPS functions where um, agencies need to communicate across agency, and today that's very, very difficult, if, if not impossible. So, um, move to. So, uh, this last year we submitted a, a budget change proposal to, uh, through the process through the Department of Finance and the Governor's Office, which was approved, and I think I reported that uh, to you. Um, at the July meeting. Um, that was a five-year program for $59.5 million to build out a program that we call CRIS, which is the California Radio Interoperability System. I'm really, really pleased to report that within five and a half months, we deployed the first six sites and turned them on. On December 18th, we, we made the first official transmission on the CRIS system from, from this building to a, um, one of our technicians that was in Bakersfield and then subsequently about 75 miles north of Bakersfield for a second call when CHP was, uh, was present for a demonstration. Um, also on December 20th uh, and then again on January the 1st, I personally drove Highway 99 South and 5 coming back with a radio um, and took uh, radio strength measurements and it was phenomenal coverage from Sacramento all the way up halfway up the grapevine before I lost coverage. Um, and same thing uh, coming back north uh, to well north of, of Sacramento. So I'm really, really pleased with that. So that means within five and a half months of receiving the, the go-ahead, we had six sites deployed. The real advantage to the CRIS system is that we're going on existing sites. We're not having to build any greenfield sites. So, so um, it really expedites the, the process. And kind of coupled with that, um, in order to provide the backhaul for a digital system, uh, we're relying on the upgrade to the CAPSNET system, which I'll get, I'll cover in just a couple of minutes, um, to provide the backhaul uh, via digital uh, digital connection. Um, we're actually still waiting to get the remainder of the staff on the on the project. We've had a senior a senior engineer assigned, as, as well as a supervising engineer, have been working diligently on this, uh, you know, since. Uh, since its inception, and uh, the rest of the team should come on board around the 1st of February. Uh, additionally, for year two, um, we have um, acquired the equipment, we've ordered the equipment for 34 additional sites. So, and that will, and the deployment for that is, um, will cover the, the North Valley, basically Highway 5 going north, the Bay Area, and then into uh, Los Angeles, uh, Ventura, and Orange Counties uh, in year two. 
um, and then the following years it was we get a little bit more into some of the the more rural jurisdictions of the state you know we will have some additional challenges but um, within the first two to three years we'll have a vast majority of the population covered by this program um, So our, 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 our vision is is that this will be a subscriber-based system to help you know continue um, to, to provide the maintenance for the system with the agency-specific assigned talk groups, and PSC will be working with individual agencies uh, to develop the talk groups as well as some overarching uh, talk groups which will allow interoperability during times of disasters, and that can be loaded into all the radios. Um, we're also looking at some uh, interoperable shared talk groups with um, other jurisdictions. We've had uh, discussions with Sacramento County. We've had discussions with the L.A. Ricks Project, uh, which will vastly improve the coverage in those two jurisdictions and then have some ability to roam onto other systems uh, in a, a quid pro quo type basis where, say, Los Angeles would send one of their transportation buses up as far as Sacramento, uh, and be able to operate seamlessly on the Chris system in exchange for um, for Highway Patrol or Caltrans or some agency from the state to be able to operate in the Los Angeles area and have really super improved coverage. Um, the features of this, it is a P25 trunk system, so the using a phase two radios, we will provide 10 time simultaneous talk groups, or talk uh, conversations going on per site, um, and then he, and go, if, you, if we're into phase one, it would be five talk groups. It does offer encryption, which I know is of great interest to the Highway Patrol. Uh, GPS location services are part of the radios. Uh, Wi-Fi programming, we can actually reprogram the radios via Wi-Fi over the air um, and not have to have um, the, the radios actually come into some kind of a depot to be connected to a computer. Um, we will have a 24-7 network operating center here at the, at the uh, PSC campus. Um, and then we can also provide, uh, you know, special talk groups for some kind of a special, um, you know, special event that might be occurring, such as a county fair. As I said, um, yeah, just forget the Olympics. That's, that's too far out. Um, so this, uh, this map that you see here is kind of the five phases that we... Um, and we envisioned for the program, as I said, uh, phase one, the first uh, in the Central Valley has been completed. That's done with six sites. Uh, phase two, which is in the Bay Area and some areas going north on Highway 5, as well as the, the um, L.A., Orange County, Ventura County areas will be part of phase two. Phase three will be the, um, uh, basically the, the Pacific you know, up from Ventura, uh, up north of Ventura, Santa Barbara, and, and counties north up up to uh, basically Silicon Valley that that is not covered in phase uh, uh, in phase two. Uh, phase four will be the North Coast, um, which will, we know is going to be a significant challenge, particularly along Highway One, as well as going out uh, towards the Arizona border along the the, uh, the Mexican border. Um, and then five, uh, which is the, really the long pole in the tent as far as being able to ensure coverage will be you know, up, up through the, the, uh, the Sierras on the east side of the Sierras and up into uh, the northern parts of California. This, uh, this slide right here is a, a, a modeling of the radio coverage that's, a, that's being supplied by the first six sites. Um, and as I said, I did drive it personally on... on uh, in December and the 1st of January, um, and know that all the way down and halfway up the grapevine, we have coverage. So we have really, really good coverage through that. We are doing some uh, system optimization, and we're looking to uh, to actually start bringing public safety agencies and agencies on the system probably around the 1st of June. Um, I've talked with Chief Howland about the, the potential for some of his units being able to have access to the system to check it out, just not to rely on it from a public safety perspective because it's not ready for prime time yet, uh, but it will um, give us a real life test of, of how that system uh, can function. The next phase, as I said, is phase two. This is the depiction of the, the coverage uh, uh, forecast for the six sites in the, in the Bay Area. It uh, does not include the, the coverage in, in Southern California, uh, but <coughs> As you can see, 
if you exclude um, the, the area to the left side, which is out in the ocean, uh, we actually have pretty decent coverage through, uh, throughout, the San Francisco, uh, throughout the San Francisco area. Any questions on the CRIS system? What yes, sir. Range? That it's 700 megahertz, yeah. And that's a proprietary radio. Is it part of the trunk system? It will be a trunk system, yes. Um, I think the, the you know the future goal is we know that Cal Fire operates in VHF, uh, you know, in conventional. Uh, there is the potential, you know, down the road to be able to connect some of that through the core, so that you know units that are say going up, up through um, five and up through 99 can at least be able to, to communicate with something in in the more rural districts. But that's that is something that's that's a little bit beyond years one and two. Pat, quick question. I, I know when we look at uh, radio, I, I think we all look at the same things. We're looking at coverage, capacity, and reliability from that standpoint. It sounds like because you're using existing sites with uh, redundant backup that the reliability is built to the, the standard that we expect uh, as far as all our sites. Ab absolutely. Um, yeah. And then the other question is, uh, when you look at the phased approach and you indicated that, you know, the North Coast and some of our troubling areas and you look at the Sierras and other places that we all... Uh, operate in. Have you done any mapping to basically uh, your estimates of what coverage will look like? Well, as I said, I'm still waiting to bring the, the staff on board on February 1st. So, I mean, the first six sites is uh, is really a phenomenal effort by one one engineer and and, and, the, and the, the supervising engineer. Um, um, is I mean, I'm just ab absolutely flabbergasted that we got something turned on that that quickly. Um, so. We will be, manana. <laughs> so I'll call you on the second. To call me on the second. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Give me the fourth is a Monday. So give me the fifth. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Any other questions on Chris? Okay. Uh, moving on to CapsNet. Um, as I said. So I, I just got to say that I'm extremely uh, proud of the work you guys are doing already on Chris, and. You know, when you look back, at least when I look back, you know, just 15 years ago on the Pizzer's Pick minutes that were that were out there, this has been an issue and a concept um, that goes back that far that was never implemented, even though everybody knew it was the right thing to do. Um, the Brain Trust has known that connecting all these disparate networks and making this happen was the right piece. And then um, we were fortunate enough to have um, the support of the legislature and the support of the governor uh, to get that funding and to not shoulder it back on on the agencies to to get the startup cost to have it built out and so it is really going to be a phenomenal uh, endeavor once we're complete and so I uh, just want to uh, say well done and as uh, it starts to continue to build out when we get that group put together um, I think it's going to be the envy uh, for communications in the future thank you uh, moving on to the uh, the Chris update, um, as I said, uh, we're relying upon um, the Chris system for um, our, our, the Chris system is going to be relying upon a digital backhaul technology, which is a part of CapsNet. Um, in addition, uh, the CapsNet program will also be supportive of the next generation 911. Uh, we're looking to put in a a path into every public safety answering port. That's 438. PSAPs in the state with a, a redundant backhaul for, um, you know, in case of emergencies, if we lose cellular, if we lose landlines, we've always got um, um, microwave. So we've completed 14 sites, <coughs> excuse me, the transition uh, to MPLS technology in 14 sites along the eastern Sierra. We have a contract in place with Nokia. And they're doing the site surveys and doing the engineering. We'll be actually doing the installation on 50 sites in phase one. Uh, phase two is the next 50 sites, and that's, uh, that is actually forecast to, for progress in fiscal year 21 or 2021. Um, the uh, CapsNet team is hiring engineers and IT classifications as part of the BCP. Um, that should be in place by June 30th of this year. Um, we do recognize that with MPLS technology that we could be vulnerable to attack. So we are uh, bringing on an IT classification specifically to support the CapsNet program in the security, uh, security measures that are in place there. The other um, challenge that we've had as we deployed these um, 
uh, the MPLS technology is we're actually have, having to add dishes and radios into some of the vaults, and so that's created a uh, 310 process, which is the access and the licensing for uh, use of the vaults. Um, we've been working with our partner agencies on that to expedite that process because it is a temporary installation. You know, we're putting in another radio, another dish while we make that migration to, to digital, and then we'll be removing the old analog stuff. But in the interim, we're taking up additional space in the vaults and on the towers, and so we want our partner agencies that actually own those sites uh, to become involved in that process. So we're bringing on a... Um, um, you know, some assistance to, to expedite that process because our goal is to have the entire microwave network, which is, I think, two, about 275 sites and 370 some odd paths updated within the next four years. Um, last item I have is actually not on the slide is uh, to discuss or to bring you up to speed on the uh, public safety communications enterprise system. It's the ES system. Um, we implemented uh, the timekeeping aspect of that about a year and a half ago, and that has been proved, proved out to be extremely beneficial in providing clarity to the client agencies about what the technicians and what the engineers are spending their time on, because every entry that they make as far as you know, attributing a time to a project includes a description of what they did. So that is now in place. We were able to roll that into the billing project, or uh, billing uh, aspect of the project which in, probably all got hit with a, a pretty massive bill in December because uh, it included the first four months of, of uh, this current calendar year or this current fiscal year uh, with the billings, but it, should have, it would, did include a lot of the clarity that you've been asked for, asking for. And with the automation of that system, we're now able to turn out a, a report on a budget of billing within the next month. So uh, as of today, uh, actually as of Monday of next week, we will have the billing for the month of December completed. So that will make your, should make your cash flow situation a whole lot more manageable. And that's the end of my report. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. So with regard to interoperability, the technology is part of the easiest part of it all, right? I think within the room we have eight kingdoms. Yes, sir. Uh, parks, from us, everybody, uh, everybody different than we do. CHP has different protocols and all that. We have all these entities, Santa Clara, something like that. Just wondering what the Bible is going to be as we move forward. We, we will be having a fleet mapping exercise, and that is an extremely important part of that. We will be actually reaching out to um, each of the agencies represented on this board for uh, providing a, you know, a, um, participant in the working group on that so that we, we can address all of those issues. Uh, we do know that there are different protocols between different agencies, but we also would need to set up a common protocol for, you know, for emergency responses. If we have a big one, we need everybody's, you know, to know what the same radio code is, if there's a radio code involved, or at least, you know, go back to the basics and that's plain English. Any other questions? It's a great, uh, great Thank question, you. John, and um, where we want to be uh, down the road within the entire state community. So, and not just uh, partial. So, it's gonna, it's gonna take some work, <clears throat> and it's gonna take some compromise from uh, everybody, everybody involved. Hopefully, we we write it together and, and have uh, at least a framework that we uh, agree upon. <laughs> I don't think one person wrote the Bible. I agree. That's the point. All right. Thanks, Pat. I uh, appreciate that. Um, and so I, I wanted to, before we transition to, you know, recommendations for future items, I wanted to make sure I had a, an opportunity um, for any last questions, kind of that, kind of because Pat's area is so broad, and I wanted to make sure that um, it gives us an opportunity transition time for anybody on any other issues that we have within our public safety radio um, side that we wanted to bring up or anything that you have a question on the financial side that uh, may be out there uh, standing that we need to, to surface. You guys are so nice. Okay, uh, then we'll go into uh, future recommendations on anything that uh, 
that we have. Um, future uh, recommended uh, agenda items that uh, you would like to see uh, briefed out. Do you, do you like the updates that you're getting uh, from uh, Cal OES, or is there something else in specific that you want? Or if there's a specific um, program that you're implementing, we'd love to hear uh, some of your individual successes as well and put you on the agenda on certain projects that you're working that you feel comfortable uh, presenting to the group so that we can have uh, that, uh, that dialogue. I'll take that as a, we'll continue to march, and I will uh, strong arm some volunteers on some things later down. So, very good. Okay, uh, moving on. Open it now for uh, public comment. Hearing none, um, at this time we'll take a motion to adjourn. Mitch, if I may, before I, I make a motion to adjourn, I, I just want to thank uh, you and, and your staff from the standpoint, because I, I think as I look at the agencies around the table, we all rely on you guys day-to-day uh, -to, -day to make sure our operations go. And, you know, it's as a team, we all contribute to public safety. And so uh, thank you to you and your crew for what you do to maintain our, our communications. And I think as we meet in the future to continue to have the dialogue to ensure that we're moving forward with technology and also the governance standpoint. And I think, you know, as I, I think about it, I think that that topic of interoperability probably need to dive a little deeper in from the, that reporting standpoint to make sure we're addressing those pain points and then anything we can do as a board to weigh in uh, to keep things moving forward because I, I always hate to find out we have a communications problem in the middle of an emergency. Um, and it's a whole lot easier to learn from the last one and apply the learning to the next one so that it just keeps getting easier and easier from that standpoint. And with that, Thanks. I'm happy to make a motion to adjourn. And do I have a second? All right. We are, uh, this uh, concludes the, uh, uh, our meeting here. We'll see you next quarter, and we'll get that invitation out. And I appreciate the, uh, the kind words, uh, Scott. So thank you so much.